Today we're going to be talking about how to evaluate a triple integral in cylindrical coordinates, but before we can evaluate it in cylindrical coordinates, we need to convert it to cylindrical coordinates. So in this particular problem, we've been given the triple integral with various limits of integration here of the function x times z. We've been told that the order of integration is with respect to z, then x, then y, because we have this dz, dx, dy in this particular order. We need to convert this triple integral into cylindrical coordinates. And as a reminder, we have our standard Cartesian coordinates here, x, y, z, in three variables in three dimensions. When we convert that to cylindrical coordinates, it looks an awful lot like polar coordinates. If you remember from polar coordinates, when we were dealing with two dimensions or two variables in Cartesian coordinates, we had just x and y. And when we converted that to polar, we got r and theta. Well, you can see that with cylindrical coordinates, we're going to do the same thing. x is going to become r, y is going to become theta, essentially, and z is going to stay the same here with cylindrical coordinates. When we add that third dimension to a Cartesian coordinate system, we also add it to the cylindrical coordinate system. It's going to stay the same. So z is going to stay the same across both coordinate systems. We're not really going to need to convert that variable. I've also got my conversion formulas for Cartesian coordinates to polar coordinates. If you remember, we have x equals r times cosine theta, y equals r times sine theta, and r squared equals x squared plus y squared. When we have a triple integral like this one that we're converting, we're going to need to convert three components. The function itself, which in our case is x times z, our order of integration dz, dx, and dy is going to need to become dz, dr, d theta, and our limits of integration. So let's go ahead and start with our limits of integration so that we have those to write in when we end up writing our converted triple integral. So our innermost limits of integration here are going to correspond with z because z is the innermost variable in our dz, dx, dy notation here, our order of integration. So we have z z equals 2 and z equals square root of x squared plus y squared. Well, if you remember, we said that we didn't need to convert z because it stays the same across two coordinate systems. And for z equals 2, that's fine because on the right hand side here of z equals 2, we've got no x or y variables involved. But for z equals the square root of x squared plus y squared, we're going to need to change that x and y into r and theta. So we have z equals square root of x squared. For x, we're going to substitute r cosine theta. When we substitute r cosine theta and then we square it according to that exponent right there, we're going to get r squared cosine squared theta. Then we're going to say plus, and here when we plug in r sine theta for y and then square it, we're going to get r squared sine squared theta. This is our lower limit of integration, z. From here, we can factor out an r squared, so we get r squared times cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. And if you'll remember from our trigonometric identities, cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta is just equal to 1. So r squared times 1 is just r squared. When we take the square root of r squared, we're just going to get r. So r is our lower limit of integration. So our limits of integration for z, we'll write it up here, we'll say z is going to be from lower limit of integration r to upper limit of integration 2. So we'll go ahead and write that there as a reminder. Now our next variable here is x. We've got dx, right? Which means the limits of integration on this middle integral here relate to x. So we have essentially x equals the square root of 4 minus y squared. Well, if we make some substitutions, if instead of saying x equals, we say r cosine theta equals, we use this conversion formula, we say r cosine theta is equal to, now over here on the right hand side, we have square root of 4 minus y squared, so square root of 4 minus, but for y, we're going to plug in r sine theta, and when we square it, according to that right there, we get r squared sine squared theta. Now, if we can just simplify this equation and solve it for r, because remember, x becomes r over here. If we solve this for r, then we'll have our upper limit of integration for r. So what we want to do is square both sides to get rid of the square root sign. We'll get r squared cosine squared theta is equal to 4 minus r squared sine squared theta. 
we'll add r squared sine squared theta to both sides and get r squared cosine squared theta plus r squared sine squared theta is equal to 4. If we factor out an r squared, we're left with cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta, which if you remember from this step up here, is just one. So we have r squared is equal to four. Taking the square root of both sides, we get r is equal to positive or negative two. Now, if we did the same thing with this lower limit of integration for x, and we said x equals negative square root of four minus y squared, and we plugged in our conversion formulas here, we'd end up with the same answer, r equals positive or negative two. So we don't actually have to do that one, we just know already that our upper and lower limit of integration for r, we're gonna have r negative two to positive two, like this. Now if we move on to y, we have dy here as our third variable in our order of integration. That means our outermost integral, the limits of integration there relate to y. So we've got y from negative two to positive two. y is gonna become theta. Well, theta is the easy one, because if you remember the domain of theta is gonna be from zero to two pi. If we have our polar coordinate system here, if you remember, polar coordinate system here, and the angle starts at zero, goes all the way around here, our angle theta, until it comes back, and at the point that it comes back, it's two pi, so this is zero and two pi. The domain of theta, therefore, is just zero to two pi, so theta is gonna be zero to two pi. We don't even have to use conversion formulas to find corresponding values for negative two and positive two. At this point, we're almost ready to write out our triple integral. We can go ahead and start it and put in our limits of integration. So if we say the integral, we write our three integrals here. We know that we're gonna have our order here, dz, dr, d theta. So since d theta is last, we need our limits of integration for theta to come last. So zero to two pi. We're gonna have dr here in the middle, so our middle integral is gonna be from negative two to positive two. And then dz is gonna be on the inside, so our innermost integral is gonna be from r to two. Now when it comes to our function x times z, z we leave alone because remember we say z stays the same across coordinate systems, but x we're gonna substitute r cosine theta. When we do this, when we convert from Cartesian coordinates to cylindrical coordinates, it's also very important to remember that whenever we do this, we need to go ahead and multiply it by an additional r. The coordinate systems don't translate perfectly in a direct way like this, x to r, y to theta, and z to z, so we need to add an additional r. So normally for x, we just plug in r cosine theta, right? So we get r cosine theta. We'd multiply that by z, z stays the same, but we now need to multiply it by an extra r. We add an extra r, your triple integral won't come out correctly if you don't add this extra r in. So we've got r and then dz dx dy just becomes dz dr d theta. And now as you can see, we have no x's and no y's left over. We've completely converted to cylindrical coordinates. At this point, it's just a matter of evaluating this integral. So because we have dz on the inside, we're gonna integrate first with respect to z. We'll get the integral from zero to two pi, the integral from negative two to positive two. And here, integrating with respect to z, before we do that, let's go ahead and call this here r squared, because we have r times r, z cosine theta, just to simplify it a little bit. So integrating with respect to z, we're gonna get one half r squared z squared. Remember when we integrate with respect to z, we hold r and theta as constants, so they just stay there as like a constant coefficient on this z variable here. So they stay. We're gonna be evaluating this on the interval, z equals r to z equals two, and we leave dr and d theta for later. Plugging in our upper limit of integration, z equals two, we'll get zero to two pi, negative two to positive two. Z equals two, we're gonna get two squared, which is four. Dividing that by two, we're gonna get two r squared cosine theta. And then subtracting whatever we get when we plug in z equals r, we get minus one half r squared times plugging in r for z, r squared again gives us r to the fourth, 
and then cosine theta d r d theta. Now, according to our order of integration here, our next integration variable is going to be r. We're going to integrate with respect to r. So we're going to leave 0 to 2 pi out here for theta later. And then integrating with respect to r, we're going to get 2 thirds r cubed cosine theta. Then we're going to get r to the fifth, but we got to divide by 5, which means we're going to get minus 1 tenth r to the fifth cosine of theta, and we evaluate that on the interval r equals negative 2 to r equals positive 2, leaving d theta out here for later. Plugging in our upper limit of integration, r equals positive 2, 2 cubed is 8 times 2 thirds is 16 thirds cosine theta minus r to the fifth is 32, so we get minus 32 tenths cosine theta. Now we're going to subtract whatever we get when we plug in negative 2. So minus here. Negative 2 cubed is negative 8, so we're going to get a negative 16 thirds cosine theta. Negative 2 to the fifth is negative 32, so we're going to get negative 32 over 10, but we have this negative sign, so we're going to get plus 32 over 10 cosine theta and then we'll leave our d theta out here for later. We need to do some simplification here. We're going to end up with 16 thirds cosine theta minus 32 over 10 cosine theta minus a negative 16 thirds is positive 16 thirds cosine theta and then minus a positive 32 10 gives us just a negative 32 tenths cosine theta d theta. Now we can combine all of these if we find a common denominator. Our common denominator is 30. So in order to get a common denominator of 30 on all this stuff, to get 16 thirds, we'll multiply by 10 over 10. That's going to give us 160 over 30 cosine theta. Here, for 32 over 10, we'll multiply by 3 over 3. That's going to give us minus 96 over 30 cosine theta plus 160 over 3 cosine theta minus 96 over 30 cosine theta d theta. If we do the arithmetic there and then reduce our fraction, we're going to end up with the integral from 0 to 2 pi of 64 over 15 cosine theta d theta. Now evaluating this integral with respect to theta, we're going to get 64 over 15 times sine of theta, but then we need to evaluate that on the interval theta equals 0 to theta equals 2 pi. Plugging in our upper limit of integration 2 pi, sine of 2 pi is 0. 0 times 64 over 15 is just 0. Then we subtract whatever you get when we plug in theta equals 0. Well, plugging in 0 here, sine of 0 is just 0. Multiplied by 64 over 15 is 0. So we get 0 minus 0, and our final answer is just 0. Funny that the answer worked out to be just zero, but that's how you convert a triple integral from Cartesian coordinates to cylindrical coordinates and then evaluate the triple integral and cylindrical coordinates.